Today's video is on homeostasis and that is maintaining a constant internal environment within our bodies. I'm going to be looking at water level, blood sugar levels and temperature and I'm going to start by looking at water levels. Now we need to keep our water level, our water content of our blood within a safe safe range and we do that by monitoring the amount of water present and what monitors that is the osmoreceptors which are present in the hypothalamus which you can find in your brain. So what happens is the blood flows through the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus decides if there's too little or too much water and depending on that a different response will be brought about. Let's take the first situation which is when there's too little water so in this case we want to produce less urine so that we can maintain more of that water, keep it back into our bodies and keep our blood water levels up. Ah, my Fitbit's vibrating, that feels really strange. So, what happens in this case is the osmoreceptors will detect that there is too little water in our blood. We'll send a signal to the pituitary gland to release more ADH. Now remember ADH is a hormone that stands for antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic is something which makes you wee, something like coffee or tea. So an antidiuretic hormone will be like effectively anti-weeing hormone. So it'll actually help you conserve more water. So it might help you if you can actually remember it like that. So this um, excess of ADH travels in our blood to our kidney where it acts on the collecting duct. If you're less certain on the kidney, have a look at my video which is here and I've actually talked about ADH here too so I don't know, maybe you'll prefer how I explained it there because this is just a summary. So what happens is the ADH acts on the collecting duct and it makes the walls more permeable. So what that means is that more of the water flowing through the collecting duct is reabsorbed back into the blood thereby increasing our water levels. This means that there's less water left over to travel to our bladder and therefore as a result we'll produce less urine. So our urine in this case will be more concentrated, it will be more yellow, it will be smellier and it will be lower in volume. Let's take the opposite scenario if we drunk too much water. Our osmoreceptors will decide that there is too much water in our blood so it will send a signal to the pituitary gland to release less ADH. That means that less ADH acts on the collecting duct less water is reabsorbed into the blood and therefore more water is available to form urine. So our urine in this case will be higher in volume, it will be less concentrated and it will be less yellow. So, and it will be less smelly altogether, so more pleasant I would say. Right, whistled through that topic, now we're going to look at blood sugar levels. It's really important that we maintain our blood sugar levels within a safe range. After we've eaten what happens is we need to lower our blood sugar levels. So insulin will be released from the pancreas. Now what insulin does is it causes glucose to be converted into a storage compound which we call glycogen. That glycogen is stored in the liver thereby removing the excess glucose from our blood. However, if we haven't eaten for a while or we've done a lot of exercise, we'll find that our blood sugar levels will decrease rapidly. So we need to up them. So in this circumstance, the pancreas releases a second hormone, this time called glucagon, not to be confused with the storage compound glycogen, and that glucagon causes the glycogen in the liver to be converted back into glucose, thereby increasing our blood sugar levels. Third topic, we're talking about temperature. There are thermoreceptors in our brain, i.e. receptors which are sensitive to temperature, and, what, and they're present again in the hypothalamus and they will decide if our temperature is either too high or too low. Remember we need to keep within the perfect range because of our enzymes because if it's too high the enzymes denature, they don't work anymore or if it's too low the enzymes don't work fast enough to um, catalyse our metabolic reactions. So if we are too cold what will happen is we will shiver and that contraction of our muscles to cause us to shiver generates heat energy. Second of all our Vessels, rather than vasodilating, will vasoconstrict, that means they narrow, which pulls them away from the surface of our skin and means that less heat is radiated. And then finally, the hairs will stand up on our arms. Remember, air is a very good insulator, and what that will do is it will trap a layer of insulating air close to our skin, and it will mean that heat is lost less rapidly by conduction. If we are too hot, what will happen this time is the opposite. We'll find that the hairs lay down on our arms because we don't need that effect so strongly. We don't need to trap insulating air because actually we want to encourage heat loss. The vessels in our faces, they will vasodilate, that means they widen, that means the blood flows closer to our skin, so therefore the heat can be radiated off our face more quickly and you'll see us all go pink after we've exercised, for example. And then lastly, we sweat. Now sweating is a great way of reducing our temperatures because what happens is that sweat needs to be removed from the surface of our skin through evaporation. The evaporation of the sweat requires energy and that takes heat energy away from us, again lowering our temperatures. 
Just as a side note, note that animals, furry animals, don't sweat. That's because they have hair, and that what that does is it traps air close to their skin, and there's no way you could evaporate sweat off of that, so instead they pant. Ah, there's a side note for you. Hope you found this video helpful. It was quite high level, but I did just want to cover all three topics together. Remember, homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal state to keep us the happy, healthy humans that we are. So I'll see you very soon. Don't forget to subscribe. Tell your friends about my channel. I'm trying to increase my subscriber numbers because they're a bit pathetic at the moment. To all of you that have subscribed, thank you so much. I love you all. And I'll see you very soon. Bye. On a hot day, there is less water in urine. Explain how the kidney is able to reduce the water content of urine produced on a hot day. Three marks. Nice, straightforward question, this. First of all, you need to say that more ADH is released. This leads to the increased permeability of the collecting duct, and therefore more water is reabsorbed. So basically, the steps that I just listed in my summary. Um, this is a slightly different sort of question, but I wanted to show it you anyway. The table lists the effects of some hormones. Complete the table by naming each hormone and its source. The first one has been done for you. Converts glucose to glycogen. Yep, that's insulin and it's made in the pancreas. Stimulates male secondary sexual characteristics. The hormone responsible for that is the main male hormone, which is testosterone. And they've told us that's produced in the testes or the testicles. Next hor hormone, so this time it's going to increase the permeability of the collecting duct. That is ADH. And where is that made? It is made in the pituitary gland. Um, next up, repairs the uterus lining. That is oestrogen, and oestrogen is produced in the ovary of a woman. B. Cells do not store glucose. Instead, it is converted into glycogen to be stored. Suggests why cells do not store glucose. Right, the reason for this is because glucose is soluble and it would have a horrible osmotic effect drawing water into and out of your blood, which is completely useless. You don't want that to happen. So for the first mark, say that it's because glucose is soluble and second mark, and therefore it would have an osmotic effect. C. The graph shows changes in the relative level of glucose, glycogen and insulin before and after a meal. Give the letter of the line which represents changes in the relative level of glycogen. Well, remember after a meal, glucose gets converted to glycogen for storage. So we can see where the meal was taken on the x-axis and that the glycogen levels remain the same. Oh no, my granola's ready. Bear with me. And therefore, um, as time passes, the glycogen levels will increase because some of that glucose will indeed be converted to glycogen. The drawing shows an elephant. Elephants live in Africa where it is hot. The elephant is adapted to live in a hot environment by having large ears. Suggest how having large ears helps prevent the body temperature of the elephant from rising too high. Right, large ears means large surface area. If you have a larger surface area, then you have can have greater heat loss. Um, the second point you really want to make is to do with the blood capillaries in the ears and that they will vasodilate, which will lead to greater heat loss. And then you can add a random um, point about the fact that they can flap their ears to cool them down. But yeah, it's only worth three marks. So you could say so many things here. Large surface area to increase heat loss, um, vasodilation, and you're done pretty much. B. Explain why the elephant may die if its body temperature rises too high, two marks. I touched on this in the video. It's because if the body temperature gets too high, then the enzymes will get denatured, and therefore they won't be able to catalyze metabolic reactions anymore. Very happy I just found this question because it's testing lots on what I was just talking about in the tutorial. Question 5a. Describe what is meant by the term excretion. This is a definition you're just going to have to learn off by heart. And excretion is the removal of waste products of metabolism. And that will be worth two marks right there. B. The diagram shows a section through the skin with two structures labelled A and B. The structures labelled A and B play a part in homeostasis when a person enters a very warm environment. 1. Explain the role of structure A. Don't panic here. Remember when it's very warm, what do we do? I just said we vasodilate, we sweat, and our hairs lay flat. So it's going to be to do with that. Now the most sensible option for A, if you're not clear on this diagram, is that it is a sweat pore. And what that will do, so first of all say that it will release sweat, and that the evaporation of this sweat will result in cooling or heat loss. And actually you need just about seven words and you'll get three marks there. So just say releases sweat and the evaporation of which leads to cooling. Part two, explain the role of structure B. Let's have a look at structure B. Well, it's obviously got nothing to do with the hair because the hair is the thing in the middle that's really dark. The only thing it can sensibly be is a blood capillary. So remember that the vasodilation of capillaries or blood vessels leads to the blood being closer to the skin and therefore, again, more cooling can take place. So although these questions seem quite hard, just say a few keywords and you will have hit the three marks. 
C. Some hormones are involved in homeostasis. Explain the role of insulin in homeostasis. Right, remember that insulin lowers the blood sugar levels. How does it do this? By converting glucose into glycogen for storage in the liver. 2. Explain the role of ADH in homeostasis. Okay, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. The ADH controls the amount of water in our blood, and the way it does that is by altering the permeability of the collecting duct in the kidney. So more ADH leads to more water being reabsorbed and less urine being produced. I just said like six marks. If you want me to summarise, you can say, first of all, ADH controls the water level, the second mark by altering the permeability, third mark of the collecting duct. Nice. D. Exercise increases the rate of sweating, but people also sweat at rest. Explain how the rate of sweating of a person at rest is affected if that person is in hot air. Okay, you need to talk about the rate of sweating, so you need to say here whether it's increased or decreased, and say why. So obviously, if the person's in hot air, they're going to sweat more, um, and the reason why is because you need to cool the body or to maintain the body temperature, so that's not too bad. Two, explain how the rate of sweating of a person at rest is affected if that person is in air with high humidity. Right, remember that the whole point of sweating is that it evaporates off the skin and that cools the body. The problem is if you're in high humidity, it means that there's a lot of moisture in the air, so there is no diffusion gradient, i.e. there isn't actually that much difference between the amount of moisture on the skin compared with the amount of moisture in the air. So actually not very much sweating will happen. That's an overview. However, this is only worth two marks. So just say here that you need to... So just say here that there is less evaporation and um, there is more sweating effectively. And actually that's all you need to say.